they are very happy to have uh, Raghu here. And uh, so Raghu is, uh, uh, he finished his PhD from Stanford and now he's in Princeton. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about, in a very Stanford style, about the music, so I think will be talking. Yes. So we are looking forward to that. Yes. And, uh, Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, entanglement in string theory, but first just let me say two applications where the ideas of entanglement have been very concretely useful in establishing non-trivial results. One is of course in the field of many body physics where uh, concepts like D of R G and relatedly matrix product algorithms. states can be used to efficiently compute correlation functions at least uh, uh, in one D gap Hamiltonians. So let's say you have a one D uh, spin chain and the Hamiltonian is gap. So there is some complicated ground state because the Hamiltonian is generally chaotic, interacting. And if you want to compute low point correlation functions, it is very efficient to compute it using this method. And the ideas behind these algorithms are inspired from entanglement. They depend on the fact that if I have a 1D chain of, of sites, and no matter how long the system size is, if I cut it at some point, the amount of entanglement between the left and the right is a constant. Okay. <clears throat> Second that I want to uh, is from high energy physics. Uh, is in proofs of energy conditions, proofs of the average null energy condition. And um, yeah, the, there's also a stronger condition called the QNEC, which has been discussed recently, but there the ideas of that proof seem to involve other things. But this is the statement that if I have some flat Minkowski uh, space time, then the integral along a null line of TUU is positive. Okay, this is. Uh, I just wanted to say that there are people from various disciplines here, so some may not know what the MRG is and some may not know what the NIT is. Okay, so this is an advertisement to Google and Wikipedia, these things, because I'm not going to use them. This is just uh, okay. This is just sort of an advertisement for the idea of entanglement. I just want to say, like, so here the idea is forget about the name, the problem is. <coughs> You have a spin chain, like you have some uh, <coughs> spin a half particles, right? And you have a Hamiltonian, like sum over nearest neighbors, zi, zj, plus some coupling constant gamma uh, times sum over the sides of x, where x and z are the Pauli operators on the side. Okay, plus you can add a gamma prime sum over j, zj. So this Hamiltonian cannot be solved exactly, so you have to resort to numerical techniques. So let's say I ask you, give me the correlation function of z at site 2 with x at site 6, for example. This is the kind of thing you can compute using this set of method. It's not really important what this is, it's, I'm just trying to say that entanglement is a useful tool in developing this theory. And here, What's important is we know in classical uh, field theories, say relativistic, the energy density is positive everywhere. And in particular, TUU is locally positive, right, for each x, for each point x. But when we go to quantum mechanics, this thing can be violated. So I can have regions of space where the energy density is locally negative, in other places it's positive. So this is an integral condition on when I go along a null line that the integral has to be positive. So it's a non-trivial statement and recently it has been proven. The first proof involved ideas from, from entanglement. Okay, so this is just sort of an advertisement why entanglement entropy is an important quantity to study. So what is it? I'm just going to, for completeness, just do the a simple case. So let's say we have two spin a half particles. This is the Bell state. So we have like just two spin a half particles. These are their world lines. And the idea is to trace out one of the particles. <coughs> what that trace means is we first 
put the state like this, we construct the density matrix. So if this is a state psi, this is the density matrix. And then you're supposed to take a partial trace over B, let's say. So rho sub A. So what are the terms that are going to survive? Here we have four terms, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, and so on. The cross terms will not survive the partial trace because when we take trace over B, these two indices have to be the same. So you basically get 0, 0 plus 1, 1 divided by 2. And in matrix form, this is nothing but 1 half, 1 half, 0, 0. And this thing cannot be written in the form a pure state just on A times itself. So there is no psi such that this equation is true. So we define the entanglement entropy of A. This is the definition. Is negative trace rho A log rho A. And in this case, it will be equal to log 2. Okay, so it's positive <clears throat> and bounded by this thing. So here is just a finite dimensional quantum mechanical system. We have some kind of a correlation between A and B. So entanglement always implies correlation. So there's some kind of correlation between A and B, and that's reflected in the fact that the state of just the system A is has to be represented by a density matrix, not a not a vector in the Hilbert space. Okay, so what what does all this mean? So I'm going to draw just a pictorial representation for this operation. So here I drew the word lines of these particles. So here's particle A and here's B. And we assume that at time t equal to zero, the system was in this state. So this state was prepared using some procedure. We don't really care. You can extend this to minus infinity. So this is the get part of the, the state. And here, let me draw the bra, the bra part, that's, that's this guy. So this is A, this is B. So now let me call them actually left and right. Okay. And what we have done is we have sort of tracing out means connecting this line. Right. And so what does this mean? This, this just means the fact that on L we have to pick 0 and 0 together. So this is a diagrammatic representation of the of the density matrix. Is this picture clear or should I explain it a bit more? Okay. Yes. Sorry? It's clear. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So this is the thing that represents a density matrix. So now we go to field theory, right? This was just sort of motivation from finite dimensional quantum mechanics. So what happens when we go in, into field theory? So we get, let's say we are in for concreteness, two spatial dimensions. It doesn't really matter, but. I mean, it's not very important, but uh, I mean, just in terms of a representation, a pictorial representation, if the trace shouldn't there be some kind of maybe a, should you want to maybe close that in a loop or something? Uh, 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 just, I mean, I agree you connect the indices, but that's like just taking a diagonal. Yeah, uh, so this, thing, but, uh, would it this time doesn't really exist in the right. in the thing, right? So this the state is just existing at a certain point in time. So, but taking a trace is like integrating over the one line in some ways. Uh, uh, wouldn't you uh, just like you take a trace in finite temperature field theory? Uh, that is, uh, it's like, a, yeah. anyway, it's a matter of semantics and picture, yeah. pictures, it's not really yeah. so important that I just want to Yeah, uh, let me just stick, stick, with this. stick with this. Okay, so two spatial dimensions. So here's our, our space. Okay, there's some coordinates. And we cut the space into half by just a straight line. So it divides the thing into two half planes. So this is now the system L and this is the system R. Okay. And we want to do the same thing. We want to sort of trace out the degrees of freedom in L and get a density matrix for R. 
Now, this is not a finite dimensional system, and, uh, and this entanglement entropy is going to come out infinite. So, watch the hand wavy way to see it. So, the Hamiltonian of this, let's say we just have a scalar field, so is going to be uh, one half phi dot squared plus one half grad phi squared, right? That's the Hamiltonian. Let's focus on this term. Let's say the spatial point located just here and just here. Fo let's focus on these two points and look at the phi excitations, what's happening to them in the ground state. They are separated by this guy. Because there's an energy cost to the gradient in phi, these two numbers can't be very different. The fields that are sort of close to each other have to be correlated, otherwise you will incur a huge energy cost because of this term. So this is an intuitive way to see why there has to be correlation between fields in the ground state of local Hamiltonians like this. And this further sort of tells you that there is correlation all along this sort of line. So whatever this entanglement entropy is of the left will be proportional to sort of the length of, I will explain, of this Rindler horizon. Okay, and uh, the point is the coefficient of this is going to be uv divergent. So the entanglement is a dimensionless quantity, so it's proportional to the length. So it comes with a 1 over epsilon, where epsilon is the uv cutoff. Okay, so it's not really a finite, well defined quantity, it's a uv divergent quantity. Um, are there any questions? So what is the length of what is written in the course? Length of the Strindler horizon, it's this length. So let me call this direction x. So this is Lx over epsilon. Okay, Lx is really infinite because we are in flat space, but let's imagine cutting it off, putting in some infrared cutoff, putting it in a box. So this is proportional to L sub x over epsilon. So what is the formal way to compute these things? Now, this log is kind of annoying. So, so sorry. Uh, yes. Why is it length and not length to some power divided by epsilon? It's because I focused on this case, two spatial dimensions. So in three dimensions, this would be the area of the horizon. So here I just have these two, right? The spatial dimension, then there's a time. So in higher dimensions, it would I mean, be... Pictorially, pictorially, I agree that it seems like it has to be the length, but I mean, is there some other... Why, why, is, it, why is it a length to some 1.25? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's an extensive quantity, like it. I guess for that intuition tells you that if you just had one bit, it's order one, and the number of bits, if you wish. Yeah, but I guess what Aninda is worrying about is maybe there are degrees of freedom like this. So for each sort of slice in X, you get some some uh, some spread, but. That, that the amount of qubits that are correlated yeah, this way one. is set by sort of the correlation length. It doesn't depend on the length this way. So that's some UV property, right, that will not depend on how big it is. Yeah, no, it might change the boundaries. I Sorry? guess it's important for you that the transfer direction is infinite. Yeah. If there was a boundary, then of course this, you know, there, there would be another scale in the problem. But it's important for you that you're in two spatial dimensions and non compact, right? You're on a plane and you're looking at, a, at, at some region on Yes, but I still think if the, if the region in the plane is sufficiently big, like much bigger than the correlation length, then if I expand in powers of the infrared cutoff divided by the correlation length, this would still be the leading piece. And that's the, right, but if you're the cylinder, for example, yeah. or, or you're not sure, and then you might worry more about... Uh, yeah, yeah, so I'm assuming here that the only length scale are the UV cutoff, the correlation length, and this infrared cutoff. Like, it's not like one of the dimensions is being kept compact, then of course it's, it's not true, right? Yeah, I'm assuming that this length is really the only infrared scale that, that matters. But right now you're, you're, you're sufficiently generally you would have added a mass to the scale of Yeah, yeah. And this actually holds in higher dimensions even for conformal theories. In 1D that's not true. So in 1D I specifically said gap Hamiltonians. If you have a critical, like a gapless Hamiltonian in 1D, 
then the entanglement entropy of a region of length L grows like log N. Okay, so that's why this DMRT methods fail in the case of critical things because as you make the system size bigger and bigger, the number of degrees you have to keep track of also grows and the numerical methods uh, don't work. So, uh, if it's at a master, yeah. no, this term will still be changed. There will be other terms. It's a short distance property, right? The, the mass is, again, it's kind of a, it doesn't affect the UV properties of, it's uh, irrelevant. So it's a relevant deformation, so the UV properties don't change on adding a mass. So of course, I'm like omitting a bunch of terms here, like there are order terms of L to the lower powers, there's a dependence on the mass and so on and so forth. But this will always be a, sort of a universal. Okay, so let me say one word about how these quantities are at least formally computed. So this row log row is not a nice thing to work with. So, so you try to look at, for example, this quantity, rho to the 1 plus epsilon. And when epsilon is small, you do a Taylor expansion. The first term is rho, but the second term is epsilon rho log rho. Uh, yes. You said that if you add a mass, uh, yeah. this first uh, yeah. uh, the reading order, the reading order, is that so the UV properties, right, are set by the kinetic term in the Hamiltonian of the ground state. If I add the mass term, it, for example, in the UV, this is still a free CFT. And the entanglement properties, as I just showed you, there are degrees of freedom that are arbitrarily close to this cut, right? So those things are sort of UV sensitive. And those don't care about what mass you put in, because mass is, a, again, an intranet. It's because, so because this was proportional to the length, right, that, that I argued, and this is dimensionless. So epsilon is a lattice sort of, if you put, think, imagine putting it on a lattice, so to make it dimensionless, you just divide by one power of epsilon. If you were in D spatial dimensions, so D spatial dimensions, this would be L to the D minus 1 divided by epsilon to the D minus 1. It's a dimension. Okay. So the idea is to think of the log as coming from a series expansion in epsilon. Okay, so this also we don't know, but let's imagine we do rho to the n for n belonging to uh, integers. Okay, let's say positive integers. Okay. And the idea is let's say we compute these for all integer n and the thing as a function of n turns out to be sufficiently nice to allow analytic continuation to near 1, then we can read off what the rho log rho quantity is. Okay, and of course there is a trace. So now I am going to draw a picture that would look somewhat like this. So here is our, and let me just draw a line now instead of drawing these two. So this is L, R, and now I'm suppressing the x, x direction. So one way to prepare the ground state of a Hamiltonian is to do Euclidean evolution for an infinite time. So this is um, Euclidean time. So you start with some state. Let's call that uh, initial, some any in state. This could be any state in the Hilbert space. You apply e to the minus h times a large positive number capital T. And what this will do is project you onto the ground state of the, of the system. The reason is you can expand the, this initial state as, pow, as a series in, in the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And this thing will damp the ground state the least. So, so you get this, right? So we do this infinite time evolution and on this strip we get this, uh, the ground state. So now the state here is the ground state. Now we can do a similar thing and prepare the, the bra. So this is the cat and we can prepare the bra in a similar way. So it's infinite in this direction. 
And now what are we supposed to do? We were supposed to trace out the left part, right? So tracing out means identifying these two objects up to this point. So that kind of starts looking like, like this, where so here is the so a matrix has a row and a column. So this is kind of the the row index of the matrix, and this is the column. So okay, so this is now a density matrix. This is so if if you specify some some field eigenstate phi phi one here on this cut and some field eigenstate phi two here on this cut. This path integral would compute rho uh, phi one phi two. It would compute a matrix element. So depending on the precise boundary condition you put, it will produce you different matrix elements of the density matrix. Okay. So what is rho squared, right? This is rho. So let's try to do this here. What would be rho squared? In rho squared, I have to take two copies of this system, right? That's rho squared. And uh, so rho squared ij is rho ia rho aj. So that means you have to contract these two guys, right? I like that. So now these two become the matrix indices. So this object for you is computing rho squared. In here, again, it corresponds to taking two of these and gluing sort of the bottom part here to the top one there. Okay. Here, and somehow um, this one has to be identified with this top. Okay, so now you're doing a path integral over two copies. And similarly to compute rho q, you will have to do three, where now this guy will get identified with this guy. Okay, and finally we have to take a trace, right? So that's what uh, Rajesh was saying earlier. So if now I, I glue this leg back to the first one, Okay, so this path integral on this three-sheeted guy will compute trace of rho q. Okay, so you can see how you compute trace rho to the n for n much much for n being a integer. A question. Yes. When you were calculating the first time, uh, you were just tracing out the eighth part. Yes. You have to identify the field between the upper the ground. Yes. Right? Yes. That's a computation field. But uh, no, we, that's not that's summed over. So you set them equal and you sum it over. Sum it Yes, like here we set 0 equal to 0 and 1 and 1, but we summed over the 0 and 1 possibilities. So th there is no boundary condition here anymore. The only boundary conditions are here. Was that your question? Yeah, so this phi 1 and phi 2 that you specified yes. is the boundary conditions that uh, are not like uh, while tracing out, right? That's something different. Yeah, so if you just look at this, this is computing a matrix element, yeah. trace of phi 1, phi 2. So now when we do this, right, what we are doing is, uh, let's say now this is phi 1 and this is phi 3, right? What we're doing is phi 1 rho phi 3, but what this also means is you sum over phi 1, right? So this is like computing, so when you sum over phi 1, this just becomes rho squared, the matrix element of rho squared, and so on. So when I draw these red lines and identify them, now there is no boundary condition anymore. Now it's just the whole path integral. The only boundary conditions are at the bottom here and the top here, but those don't really matter because we're doing this infinite Euclidean time evolution. Okay, so this goes by the name of replica trick. And this trick was probably invented first in condensed matter literature in dealing with disordered systems. Okay, so now what you see here is that around this point becomes special, right? This point became special and this point is not really a point, it is this whole line. And because I suppressed that other direction. It's because when you go around, let's say we start at phi 1, right? Or we start at phi 2. We are supposed to go this way, but then we end up here. 
and then we're supposed to go around and, and we go around. So the angle around the horizon is 2 pi n. It is not 2 pi. Right? So that that's what is called this conical singularity. So these these space times are not really regular. They have this conical deficit sitting at a locus which is all along this 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 uh, locus. Okay. Okay, so now we are going to transition. I'm going to draw one more diagram and then we will So there is a metric, right? We can write a metric for for that space. It is just dx squared plus dy squared. This is the 2D 2D space. Before you go there, yes. Uh, ex explicitly, for which systems are uh, results for this uh, trace over the bar and so on? I mean, except for free, free theory, is there no? But uh, I don't know. what are the what are the other? Yeah, I think those might be the only ones. Only, only, ones. only one. Yeah. And even in free, for example, Maxwell cases, there are issues regarding the exact kind of coupling at this conical deficit point. And I didn't want to get into all those details, but formally, this is the thing that, that you have to do. Okay, but essentially, what's happening here is that, um, okay, let me know. So once we add in this tau direction, right, we have made this into a into a 3D space, this third direction being the Euclidean time. But now we will change coordinates. What we will do is we will put coordinates that are, we'll call this this coordinate x. R will be the radial distance from this point. So it, okay, in all directions, and there's an angle theta. So to draw this here, I'm gonna draw. So here are our left and right systems. Okay, this is not a circle. I mean, this is really infinite. I have just drawn a circle to put an infrared cutoff on this thing. Okay, and there is this this horizon thing. Okay, so here we have r, tau. These are the coordinates in this two-dimensional plane, and then there is the translationally invariant direction. Okay, so we can write a metric, which is this dr squared plus r squared d tau squared plus dx squared. Okay, is this clear? This is sort of the left system. This is the right system. So this is really like a three-dimensional flat space, but we have put sort of cylindrical coordinates on this space. Okay, and really what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to make this tau uh, variable instead of being 2 pi periodic, you're supposed to make it 2 pi n periodic and then just compute the path integral on this space. So it really looks like a cylinder. There is there's just a disk times an infinite line. Okay, and we get all these UV singularities and so on and so forth. Um, okay, but but what's the uh, the point? Even in field theory, you can define quantities that are perfectly UV finite, entanglement related quantities which are perfectly UV finite. So this is just an aside, it, it won't be relevant, but I just want to mention it as an aside. So let's say again we have these two, uh, this two dimensional space, but now we consider two regions that are separated, okay, region A and region B. You can define something called the mutual information between A and B. Again, it's in the ground state or any state. And this thing is a UV finite quantity. Okay, you can show that this is UV finite. So there are no these epsilon business goes away because you see there are these boundaries are not close to each other. So all the UV effects that are related to the entanglement between here and here are gone. So this quantity measures directly the correlation between degrees of freedom here and here. And there's no UV divergence in that. If you look at the mutual information of 
mean, you don't have to keep, it's not because they're separated, right? It's because UV divergence is cancelled. That's the more important thing. Yeah, so the way this quantity is defined, there are some terms that come with a plus sign and some terms that come with a minus sign. And all these area type divergences, they cancel out in the end. So in the end, this is a UV finite quantity. And yeah, but my point was, if you bring them, touch them close to each other, like let's say A and B are such that they have a point in common, then you will get a UV divergence coming from that point. So they, they have to be separated. <clears throat> okay, and there's another quantity called the relative entropy. I won't even define this. You can you can read about it. Uh, I should say, like a rigorous treatment of of this, for example, has been given in Witten's recent notes. And they're nice. It's it's a review, so of course the original literature goes back to the 60s and 70s. But he also gave a set of nice lectures that are recorded at IS uh, in the in the summer. Okay, so, but I want to come now to string theory. We know that string theory famously... Yes. There's a good talk, but you know, that one point of view might be that you should really talk about things like the relative entropy and so on, which are smoother objects, and they, you know, they don't have these. Since I, I presume you're going to talk a lot about UV divergences later. One, one, one point of view might be that, you know, uh, the well-defined object is really the relative entropy. But these ones are also really well-defined rigorously. Uh, sure, I mean, those are also well-defined, and, and relative entropy is also well-defined. Yeah, yeah, so, so both might, of You might just as well, you know, not talk so much about the von Neumann entropy. And yeah. Just restrict oneself to talking about the relative entropy. Yeah. And, uh, so, I mean, what's wrong with that point of view? No, that's fine. But maybe it would be nice to have also be able to talk about the von Neumann entropy. It, it, you know, one more reason is that if you really want to define entanglement, von Neumann entropy doesn't measure entanglement unless the whole system is in a pure state. Yeah. In fact, good measures of entanglement are defined yeah. using the relative entropy. Yeah. Well. yeah. So, as, I, as it will become clear very soon, I'm going to be focusing on a very specific problem. And for that, we had better be able to make sense of entanglement. Like, let me just say a few more words and then we can come back. So, the thing I was going to say is that um, string theory famously does not suffer from UV divergences, at least strings in well defined backgrounds and so on, because strings have a finite size, so you can't really squeeze them beyond a certain limit. So, string theory gets rid of in theory UV divergences, so we can ask, uh, can the UV divergences in SEE cured within string theory? Okay, this is a sort of an idea that has been around for like 20 years or more. And um, what's the idea? The idea is, let's focus on a very concrete case where we are in, sorry, I'm going to draw this diagram. This is, this is a black hole in ADS. And it's an eternal black hole. It has two sides. So there's a left CFT and a right CFT and so this is just time and the CFT also has some spatial directions. Now this entanglement between the left and the right is not really of the type that suffers from any UV divergences because it's not the entropy of a region within a single connected piece of Minkowski space. So entanglement of left and the right, okay left with right, <coughs> in the thermofield double state, which I will write down in a bit. CFD state, this is just perfectly fine, okay? Because I'm not taking one piece of Minkowski space, cutting out a region and asking what's its entanglement with the outside. It's just two decoupled systems. They are in some entangled state. So this is now really like the, the Bell pair example. Okay, this is finite and moreover, it's equal to the black hole entropy. 
black hole entropy which sits here and it's equal to this famous area over 4 G. Okay, so this is a case that string theory better be able to get straight. If we really understand strings in some, let's say, BTZ background, we had better be able to reproduce this result in some 1 over D string alpha prime ex expansion. Okay, so what is the thermofield double state? Thermofield double state on the left and the right is just sum over n e to the minus beta en over 2 and left and right where n's are energy eigenstates. Now it's easy to see if you make this, you know, construct the density matrix just on the right, let's say, you just get sum over n e to the minus beta e n and n. And this is nothing but the thermal density matrix. And the entanglement entropy of this density matrix, the von Neumann entropy of this density matrix is equal to the black hole entropy, is equal to the thermal entropy. So this is the case that I really want to sort of hope to get from string theory. Even Sorry, but I'm yes. still not clear I understand. Uh, the, I mean, uh, how are you hoping to define the thermofield double in string theory other than in yeah, this yeah. way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because this is always a topology. I mean, yeah, yeah, we will soon go to the, uh, the Euclidean picture and we will try. So the hope would be, let me just say, I'm going to say what the next step is. So, of course, calculating this way, it's not really, we don't really know, but this is sort of a, a sort of a proof, quote unquote, that this entanglement between the left and right is a well-defined quantity and is equal to the black hole entropy. So the thing that we really want to compute from string theory is this object, somehow. Right. No, uh, I think my confusion is sort of really, uh, 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 I mean, the black hole entropy, we do calculate in string theory by counting yes. microstates and so on, uh, uh, in at least a class of... Uh, yeah, supersymmetric black yeah. holes and uh, so on, but... Uh, but okay, uh, at least in that yeah, but class, we have an autonomous definition of what constitutes microstates, and, uh, yeah. uh, and uh, we count them. Yeah, but uh, what, what I really want to want is a world sheet definition of the black hole entropy. So not some auxiliary state counting at weak coupling and then going to strong coupling and so on. That's a method we know and love and it works. But is there a way to really start with the world sheet theory and define a quantity which equals the black hole entropy on the world sheet itself? So one look at the flat space, you might just, you know, you might guess that even flat space for some region, entropy is area divided by G neutral, you know, flanks. Did you have the yes. of gravity, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are all the things that I'm going to say. So this is a very introductory yeah. lecture. So and this is exactly where I'm. Yeah. So sort maybe of. we are the blocking you. Yeah. We are uh, <laughs> slowing you down. But I, I think my basic confusion is the, uh, we don't want to presuppose the answer. Uh, uh, I mean, the black hole. Uh, we understand string theory as a as some average over a collection of microstates. Maybe no individual microstate may have anything like this geometry. Uh, and so, in what sense are we when we say that we want to calculate uh, uh, calculate uh, UV diver, I mean, calculate the entanglement? Yeah, entropy. In the sense? In, yeah, yeah. So, that, so, I'm a little confused by how even the, the question is to be framed yeah, the in a question, way which doesn't presuppose. Yeah, the Let's say we assume that the Euclidean BTZ background is a good string background. So it's some compactification of the ADS3 backgrounds, Euclidean ADS3 backgrounds. And we make some, you know, orbifold to make it into the Euclidean BTZ geometry. And let's say that is an exact string background. The question is to then implement the Gibbons Hawking procedure using in string theory. Right, so we know one way to compute the black hole entropy is this Gibbons Hawking procedure, which I'm going to review. So given a solution to the string equations of motion, can you then reproduce, for example, the free energy and take a derivative and get the temperature and get the entropy? Is there, is there any, what, what would be your reasons for believing that that should give you the entropy? I mean, uh, uh, perhaps uh, these are just some average notions which are uh, uh, which uh, 
exist in some semi-classical uh, regime, but, but uh, maybe in yeah, so theory, uh, you all you have are only some microstates uh, and uh, nothing else. Uh, <laughs> uh, we can say about the opposite. <laughs> that, 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 no, that you would have a microstate, but the microstate, the entanglement entropy is zero. Yeah, so, microstate so is a pure state. state. It's a pure state, which probably has the same geometry, but, but the entanglement entropy is zero. So the entanglement entropy differentiates between the single-sided and the double-sided map. Yes. It must be a very fine thing. In this BG set geometry, for example, where did you put in the fact that you were in a in two CFTs and not in one CFT? On the fact that the Euclidean geometry is only one-sided. It knows about the horizon because there's the so it's only one-sided. So it's a, it's some um, uh, yeah. But the Euclidean one-sided geometry knows about the entropy, right? There's a procedure we do on the Euclidean geometries that is equal to the entropy. It's not literally this procedure. I understand, but, but the thermodynamic entropy is a cold spray. It's something you can measure from outside. You know, the low energy observer knows the thermodynamic entropy, which is what you usually talk about. The okay. entanglement entropy is very fine. Let me, let, me, let me even rephrase the question. The question is given a string background that is a solution to the string equations of motion, can you define a notion of the on shell action? Okay, forget about entropy and forget about taking derivative. Let's say there's a parameter. In the, there's a family of classical solutions labeled by a parameter. In the BTZ case, that would be beta. Can I define some notion of the value of the on-shell action of the effective theory in target space? And then I can take derivatives with respect to this parameter of this class of solutions. Can I even do that in string theory? Uh, I, I, that, 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 that's probably a good question to ask. Yes. It's not clear that the results would be related to the entanglement. They would give you based in the notion of the given sorting procedure and give you a thermodynamic entropy. Yes. The thermodynamic entropy may or may not be the entanglement. As we discussed, for a pure state, it was black hole and then a microstate, which you yeah. believe most black holes in the world and some microstate. They have the entropy we expect, but they have zero entanglement entropy. Okay. All I want is the quantity that becomes, let's not go to the thermodynamic interpretation, but in terms of gravitational saddles, in the semi-classical limit reduces to the area and then there might be some alpha prime corrections to it. That quantity should exist, right? So that let's focus on computing that. And then we can debate whether it is related to some state counting and so on and so forth. That's so when you be linked to state counting, that's that's fine. Or I'm just but it may still not be related to entanglement I mean the thermodynamic entropy does tell you the number of microstates. Yes. It may or may not be the entanglement entropy is a finer grain thing. Now the entanglement the thermodynamic entropy for pure you're state and mixed state are the same. You're saying that if you find a Euclidean solution of the string equation of motion, there might not be this two-sided analytic continuation of it. Uh, well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not clear what uh, this, this quantity yeah. of computing is the entanglement of what exactly. it's not. And that's, it's, I think, what yeah. I'm also okay. with, uh, because, yeah, I understand thermodynamics, but the entanglement of some, uh, is entanglement as you defined it is of some, uh, uh, some mixed data uh, which you get by tracing out some, uh, pure state, I mean, I, what yeah. is the... Okay, I think we all understand the kind of things we are going to talk about, so let's just push ahead. Then. I think okay. it's clear, so this is, there is this one cartoon picture, there is a classical picture. Corresponding to that, there is this thermophile double state, there is this set of microstates, and counting these, you agree, might be related to the area and the semi-classical expansion of the area. And then I can just think of constructing this state back. It might not have this picture in the string theory case, but if I know I have these many microstates at that energy level, that's a good enough information that I want to have in the black hole case. This, I'm just using this that the notion of entanglement entropy has a relation to black hole entropy, at least in this case, in the classical limit, in sort of a non-quantum class, this non-stringy limit. Maybe Ed Surat's earlier question actually ends okay. with, since we're paused. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, can I ask it in a slightly different way? Uh, are there other quantities uh, which capture the non divergent parts just from a purely information theoretical or whatever way? Uh, 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 are there other quantities, maybe mutual information, relative entropy, some combinations yes. of them, which capture exactly the non UV divergent part of the entanglement entropy? Some can one? Uh, yeah, like this. Entropy. Yeah, the relative entropy or the mutual information they do. Well, capture uh, part so of. if I know uh, 
all the uh, this thing and then uh, just that is enough or will I need to also enough for what uh, for uh, for capturing the non uh, uh, divergent parts uh, no, it, no. the relative entropy will really give you the distance and the mutual information is also the relative entropy will do a particular product state so the uh, mutual information specific example of the relative entropy so okay. I think what he wants is really a count of all the microstates which is really a thermodynamic entropy that you are. I mean, that kind of object would be finite even in field theory, right? You put it in a compact region and you count the number of microstates. So, uh, I, let, let me just ask, ask one question. Yes, yeah, so I think, uh, what, are you really just going to be looking at the thermodynamic entropy or is there some, you know, which we know is UV finite even in a field theory? If you put things in a compact region, uh, you put a. Yes. Of, Yes. You put an IR the only divergence yeah. Right. yeah. This is for this case, but I'm also going to be talking about the flat space case where the other question comes in. Yeah, and, so yeah. and for the Srindler horizon case, whether string can make that finite. Just just trying to answer, are you going to tell us that epsilon can be replaced by LS? No, there's not there's so first of all, I have to apologize. There's good, not going to be any answers or new results in this set of talks. I've just been thinking about these issues and it's going to be thought of a menu of my confusions and, and so related way, things. A long time back when Sorkin and Bombelli and others were thinking about this, they yes. actually had this as, as their motivation. Yeah. Yeah, it. again, like, I think the audience is very advanced. Everybody the head of me is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to sort of mention all those things. So let me just draw some more pictures. Yeah. Okay. So that's, you're looking into this induced theories of gravity where this epsilon can come from some other SKA elements. So, so now I'm going to sketch some pictures or ideas from this paper of Suskind and Uglu from the early 90s. We said, let's look at this picture again of the 2D space time with this entanglement cut. And just look at a closed string that's sitting here. So here's a closed string. It is it is just there. Just think of this as a perturbative excitation from the vacuum. So this clearly knows about some correlation between the left and the right, right? Because it, it's on the left and it's also on the right. So something about this string should know about the uh, the entropy between the left and the right. And what it becomes in this Euclidean picture that I was drawing was so we have this 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 thing. Here was the left and the right. There was this. So there was this closed string here. And we just basically rotated this picture about this, taking this as a hinge. So we get a sphere diagram, right? So there are closed sphere diagrams that are moving in this, in this 3D flat space. And just, it's just a zero point function. It's a sphere zero point function. So now the question becomes, can you compute the sphere diagram in string theory. Are you looking at an excited classical string or uh, just a... Uh, no, perturbative excitations around the vacuum. Around the vacuum. Yes. This is just empty 3D so flat just, space. But that configuration, that, that's not a semi-classical string or a casual no. string. No. Yeah. So, so this is the this is just the space, right? And the way we completed this into space time was we thought of this line as a as an axis and rotated this by two pi. So when you do that, this thing becomes this I mean this the world sheet is a 2D object, right? It's not just a so that's so that's the sphere diagram. So log z. Okay, we can approximate this by just the, the, the sphere diagram. And the idea is that just by genus counting, this is proportional to 1 over g string squared, okay, which is proportional to 1 over g newton. So here is sort of the idea that perhaps in string theory, the epsilon can be replaced by, by g newton. This is very rough. Again, I'm not trying to be very precise here and so on. 
And why is the log? Because this is just a single string diagram. You can have multiple, like two spheres, three spheres, four spheres, and so on. So, so, so this is sort of the idea. And why is it proportional to the length? It's just because the sphere can be anywhere along the, along the, along the axis. Okay, so can we put meat on this idea? Can we actually compute this object? Let's just take flat 10 dimensional string theory and try to compute these things. Uh, that was this sort of tau coordinate I drew here. So that is this uh, 2 pi, right? So this is, the, this is the r direction, this is the x, and the third direction is this tau. It's just the Rindler, the Euclidean Rindler geometry. <laughs> okay. Okay. But uh, remember, we have to keep in mind that along all along this locus, there is really a conical singularity because we're supposed to first compute trace of rho to the n and so on and so forth, right? So, okay. So, can we make sense of these quantities? Wait, wait, wait. Uh, you, you, the, the entanglement you're trying to compute is the entanglement between the string and the rest or between no, the just the between the left and the right. Yeah, so let me just say what, what is the sort of the logic here. The entanglement between the left and the right, right is computed by an object like minus trace rho log rho, right, which is computed from some partition function of the system evaluated on an n fold replica, right? The as a function of n, right? So this is the object we want to compute from string theory. The partition function on the full space of this replicated space from string theory, right? String theory should be able to give us what this is. Just the partition function of the theory on this, on this space. And so we use the formula that first we compute log z, it is just the sphere diagram, and it's of this order. It has the right order to be the, the leading contribution. Um, of course, the one thing in there's IR dimensions here, which yeah. is just coming from the length. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. So that I have not written. That would be in the numerator here. That's because, like, when you integrate, like, the sphere world sheet sigma model has an integral over the zero modes, right? The zero modes of the sphere basically tell you where the sphere is. The sphere could be here, 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 and so on. So that's the part that reproduces the IR dimension. For example, there was this recent this written paper on yes. uh, you know, doing string theory yeah. in which he didn't compute this leading term which would have this IR dimension. No, he has an IR dimension. This, all his diagrams are proportional to the volume of the D brain intersection with the horizon. But my understanding was that he was not computing, I think he was computing what would be at least uh, the one loop, you know, the correction. Yeah, yeah, so he's not computing the sphere. So he's computing, for example, the torus. I'm going to say why that's easier in some sense, conceptually. It's technically challenging, but it's conceptually easier because we, we know that the sphere diagram in string theory, right? On the sphere, there is this uh, SL2C group, group, which is left because we are not inserting any vertex operators here, right? We're just computing sort of a string diagram. So the sphere is, is like some like string path integral dx, dg, uh, goes blah 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 e to the minus s of the nonlinear sigma model, but you have to divide by in this case a volume of SL2C, right? SL2C is sort of after you gauge fix the metric on the sphere to be let's say the round metric, you have a leftover SL2C group of fractional linear transformations, and this volume is infinite, right? So you might naively think that this is something over infinity, okay? And this is this is zero. So indeed, claims have been made in the string theory literature that 0, 1, and 2 point functions on the sphere are just 0. Because you need a minimum of 3 points to be able to fix this SL2C. And indeed, when you read, for example, Polchinski's book, the lowest sort of tachyon vertex is 3 tachyons. It's just a constant. Of course, we would like to compute 4 tachyons, and that's the scattering amplitude. But the 3 tachyon vertex is just a constant. But you don't talk about the 2 tachyon scat 1 to 1 or 1 to nothing or 0 to 0, right? But you might want to be able to define those in some way. Naively, they are all 0. Uh, 0 point functions, 1 point function, then 2 point functions on the sphere. So now concretely, this is our problem. Like, can we define this object log z, the sphere diagram, right? And circumventing this kind of obstacle. <coughs> OK. 
Okay. So I might I want to just add a comment about recent work because uh, so there are papers by I'm not going to talk about this and I don't know those papers so well, but Donnelly and Wong have studied precisely this kind of a problem in a non-gravitational string theory. So the string theory there is called the Gross-Taylor <laughs> string theory. And it's just a reformulation of 2D angles. Okay, the 2D angles theory. And there you know enough about the string theory to be able to compute this, this kind of an object. It's a non-gravitational theory, so it's not really directly related to what I'm going to talk about, but the set of two papers is interesting that sort of implement this kind of a procedure in detail. And the way they do it is to actually look at this sphere diagram with this sort of, uh, you know, a skewer going through it as a semicircle, as an open string that's doing a 2 pi, like it's, I can generate the sphere this way, right, by taking a semicircle, an open string attached to the horizon and doing this. So, in this case, the boundary condition of the open strings here, you can read it off from the 2D angles description. So, so it just kind of works in, in, in this example. Is okay. there a cross check to that? I mean, they will compute it using some string version. Sorry? Is there a cross check to the answer they have? Like, they will compute it using some string version. Yeah, they compute it in both things and the answer matches. So there is just a field theory way to compute the answer here and this way using this the Gross-Taylor action to compute it using this and the answer agrees. So what is the answer and uh, why is it not true? Why is the agreement not true? Yeah, because to the angles there's no propagating degrees of freedom. So you yeah, yeah. don't so, strictly have any you know, the divergences or any of the, uh, these things to do with. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just saying it's a case where this idea of the sphere diagram giving you the entanglement entropy works out in detail. But that's what I'm a little puzzled because what entanglement of that? This well, is even a topological theory, theory yeah, has so some entanglement. Topological, right? only some ground state. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. No, but there's still some entanglement. Yeah, but it doesn't have this UV issues. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, this was just, I don't know this paper that well. I just thought it, I just wanted to. Yeah, I'm just I'm going to ask yes. you a very nice Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, so, you want to compute this sphere diagram and uh, the target space is going to be the, that's not what you want to do. Like, can you just explain what is the sphere diagram you want to compute? Uh, we, it's, it's not, we don't want to take the target space to be the empty task space. No, that is what we want that's to do. That's what we want. Yes. So, so, so we just have, so we have one sheet and, and the target space is this, is this replica. Yeah, this replica. And, and, and that's what, that's what. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, okay, so there are various sort of comments. First of all, this thing is too quick, right? Because even the numerator can be infinite. In the numerator, there's a volume of space. So if you have a non-compact space like Minkowski space, the numerator is proportional to the volume of that space, so it's it's not really something over infinity, it's infinity over infinity. So this argument of the zero, one, and two point functions being zero in string theory is just too quick. And we know that very concretely for the case of <coughs> two point functions, for example. So let's talk about ADS3, right? So in many ADS3 examples, there are some boundary CFT operators. So, boundary CFP operators, whose two-point functions are perfectly finite, right? They're not, they're discrete states, there's some discrete spectrum and a continuous spectrum. But if you take the operators that lie in the discrete part of the spectrum, the boundary correlation function is perfectly finite, right? It's just one over this thing. So, if you have a description of the world sheet string theory in ADS3, it had better be able to reproduce this two-point function. That's one of the things you would impose on, on the string world sheet theory. And, okay, so we know a candidate string. There's this SL2R WZW models. Let's just take the bosonic case. 
And I mean, you have some spectrum of the SL2R WZW model, they're long strings, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, in the end, uh, you want to compute some like two point function, right, on the sphere, on the, on the string world sheet, and reduce it to this object. And indeed, it works out. The way it works out is that, so now we are computing a two point function on the uh, string word sheet. That's something, something like this. So what's the group that stabilizes two points? So here we have a, now I'm, I'm just drawing the sphere as a, as a plane. So this is still the word sheet. Let's insert one operator at zero and one at infinity, right? We can do this. So we have fixed two of the SL2C generators. The remaining group is just a dilatation group. So just things that scale you around the origin, keep both zero and infinity fixed. So there's still a non-compact group that's left over, okay? So when you compute this object, in the denominator, there's gonna be volume of R plus. That's just the scale of the dilatation. And indeed, when you look at the, the, the two-point functions in the WZW model, there's sort of a delta function sitting in the, in the numerator. There's a delta function of the representations. There's a J1 minus J2, and there's some finite coefficient here. So the idea in the two-point function case is that you're supposed to cancel this infinite piece with this infinite piece. And so this is explained in, for example, in the paper of Malda Sena and Oguri, uh, the third paper on correlation functions. So that's how it's supposed to work, that you're supposed to get a compensating infinity in the numerator, at least for the two-point function case. Okay, so we should be mistrustful of this, of this quick argument. And in, in, again, in flat space string theory, right, how, what would be the analog in flat space string theory? Let's say we just insert two tacky on vertex operators. So usually we would get a delta four of P1 plus P2, right? Or whatever, delta 26 of P1 plus P2. We write this as delta of E1 plus P2 times delta 25 of just the spatial vector P1 plus P2. But you see, if you satisfy the spatial delta function conservation, because it's just a one-to-one -one particle thing, the energy delta function is all automatically satisfied. Right, so this is really a delta of zero that is sitting here. And again, this volume of R plus is supposed to cancel this. And this procedure is supposed to define for you the normalization of the state created by one tachyon or one vertex operator, for example. Yes. Yes, I have a question, so these statements of, uh, of having delta as well. Yes. If you, if you were, let's say, Doing quantum field theory, yes, uh, but in a world in formalism, yeah, and uh, and you're calculating. Uh, so this is basically a self-energy correction, right? It's a correction of the propagation. Well, this is just the this is just the tree-level thing. This is not even a correction. Yeah, yeah. The sphere uh, is a is a tree-level. I mean, there are there be higher genus correction. Yeah, so the correction would be sort of a two-point function on a torus, which is perfectly well-defined uh, object in string theory. So, so if you had higher genus, uh, yes, just calculating you know, like uh, things, like, then uh, would, would you would these uh, facilities show because um, no, because there you don't have the SL2C group, right? On a torus, there is no these leftover gauge transformations. Even one point function on the zero point function on the torus is already is well defined object, like it's this torus partition function. So this SL2C problem shows up only on these three sort of diagrams in, in the closed string sector. I'm going to talk about the open string sector. But let's just say we're calculating propagated from a world line formalism. Yes, from the world line formalism in particle, in field yeah. theory, yeah. Yeah. Then, you know, like, uh, there also this delta function argument tells you that the numerator is the same. Right? That's the argument that you gave for the numerator. Yes. Uh, still holds. Yes. <laughs> So, so is there something in the denominator which cancels and gives the standard propagation? Is that how it works? I mean, uh, I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. 
Yeah, I haven't thought about it. The only thing that I know from the world line formalism to compute are once you take the propagator as given and then you start computing the vertices like using this Schwinger parameterization and so on. So I know that's a good question. What's the analog of this cancel if it exists in just any part? Any to get the propagator as an optional object. It's perfectly fine to write down delta for p1 minus p2 because you're not also multiplying it with delta functions that impose a martial. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good. So, yeah. And that, that's true here as well, right? You know, when you the moment you well maybe the on-shell two-point function has this problem. Yeah, yeah. So again, if you use a propagator, that's not. You don't have additional deltas of p squared, okay, okay. squared yeah, yeah. Delta four of p one minus p two is perfectly well balanced. Right, the propagator. I guess in this case, I mean, you should know how to go off shell because yeah, going off shell in in in, in, in string word sheet is an optical thing. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. So here I'm only talking about on shell, on shell quantities like the tachyon vertex operators that we inserted were on shell. <laughs> so that's why this is trying to define the norm of the state, the on shell state created by one tachyon. So that's a follow up to other question, which is that why don't you just take this option in the way, let's say, Ashok does it? You know, it will give you a non gauge invariant answer. Yeah. But all these problems will just go away. Yeah, yeah. That's a, I, my, yeah, again, I don't know any string field theory, so that's part of my learning program in the coming months is to but learn more about it. This problem is probably at this time. Closed string field theory should have something to say about this problem, but I don't quite know what exactly. Yet, because I don't know the subject. Yeah, I sympathize with that. Okay, so this is this this business about, and let me just say one more example in string theory where we know that the sphere partition function is well defined is just Liouville theory, right? So in Liouville theory, there is a parameter mu, right? Mu is the cosmological. I'm just going to say it in words. Mu is the cosmological constant, and we can take this log z as a function of mu and differentiate it three times with respect to mu that corresponds to inserting this uh, vertex operator, this e to the, so the action of, the action of mu will theory contains some kinetic terms, but it contains some mu e to the 2 b5. Okay, so you take three derivatives with respect to mu, and now it becomes a three-point function, right? It becomes a three-point function of these, these three objects. And this we know how to compute. Three point functions in Liouville theory are known. You get the answer, you integrate it back three times. You get some integration constants, but it's, it's, it's a, there's a well defined piece of the answer in Liouville theory. Okay, so again, like the, one of the concrete ideas in BTZ, let's say there is a BTZ sigma model for each value of beta. What you would want to compute is d cubed log z divided by d beta cubed. This thing should be a three point function corresponding to inserting a vertex operator that changes the temperature of the black hole. That is just some graviton vertex operator. So there is a vertex operator. You have to take its three-point function, compute that, and integrate that with respect to beta three times. That's a well-defined, uh, yes. I, I agree with all these, maybe, let me just say one more thing and then we will be done, okay? The one thing that I want to say is that this argument that the sphere one point function, the zero point function should be zero, is definitely correct when you have a compact target space. Then really there is no obstruction to making this argument that you have something finite divided by infinity. And there's a way to see that from the effective action in 10 dimensions. So the string theory action in 10 dimensions, just focusing on the bosonic part, has a dilaton piece, some C is some constant. And we have some stuff involving the graviton and the B field plus grad phi squared, right? Again, now, so the idea is the sphere diagram should compute the on-shell action, right? That, that's one sort of connection. So what is the equation of motion here? It's e to the c phi, c delta phi, times this stuff plus grad phi squared plus e to the c phi, 2 grad phi, grad delta phi equal to 0. And we integrate by parts, and the equation we get is e to the c phi times stuff plus. Like five squared equals 
2 over C gradient of T plus E phi black phi. Right. This is the equation we get. But this is the equation of motion for the dilaton. But what is this? This is precisely the value of the Lagrange. Right. So the on shell action is equal to integral d10x of a total derivative. Okay, so if you have a compact space, this is just zero. So again, like it's the boundary terms in in the target space that are sort of responsible for will give a non-zero contribution to these kind of operations. So that already shows you that these quantities are subtle in string theory. And I think already in the ADS3 case, identifying what corresponds to the boundary stress tensor on the world sheet was a subtle question in the papers of Kutathov and Cyber. There are some vertex operators that are almost gauged but not quite and you have to be careful about which operators to keep in the BRST cohomology and which ones to throw out. So, um, so these are the kind of questions you have to uh, face to if you are interested in this kind of business. Okay, so next time I'm going to talk about in the next two lectures some three papers. One of them is Witten's this recent paper on the open string calculation. So next time we'll focus on the open string case and we will see how this volume of SL2C which becomes for the disk diagram volume of SL2R can be made sense of. Okay, so at least for in the open string sector the disk diagram seems to be okay. And Witten's calculation was about the the cylinder diagram and then we will sort of there will be a, there is, in the third talk we will discuss a paper by Per Krauss in which he oh, I don't know if that paper is correct or not even but the interesting question there posed is so let's say we have a asymptotically flat solution to to string equations of motion asymptotically flat space times have an ADM mass right that's that's a well defined quantity at least in the supergravity limit. So how does the string world sheet compute the ADM mass of the target space time? And in this paper, they gave a concrete proposal for a, a world sheet correlation function that is supposed to compute the ADM mass of the target flat space. And so that's the thing we will talk about and related, yeah, anyway. And the jump that I wanted to make from there is that Wald has these papers in pure GR connecting sort of terms at infinity to terms at the horizon, what he calls entropy as an author charge. And one of my dreams right now is to be able to, well, first figure out whether this pear Krauss paper is really correct. And if you can implement this Wall's idea in terms of uh, taking this ADM definition at infinity and somehow trying to push it to the horizon. I don't know if it will work or not. As I said, this was a disclaimer when I, before I agreed to give these lectures, there might not be any new results. This is. About this last comment, yes. that, I mean, at least for extremal black holes, Ashok has a way of uh, defining the wall uh, okay. functional in terms of the uh, free energy. I guess it, it would be related to some uh -huh. an on shell. Oh, I see. I, I didn't know that. Okay. This is the entropy function, uh, extremal functional, entropy, entropy functional of pressure. It's at least okay. it's the same as the wall functional? In is those cases, it reduces to the wall functional, but okay. for the wall function is more general, but this is for extremal black holes. So, but potentially what he is defining there can be given a world sheet. Uh, okay, because, no, I need to look uh, at that. Okay, thanks. Yes. Where is this calculation? You have a string theory. Yes. You want to compute the actual entropy. Yes. That is not constituted by a string theory diagram. That is a very complicated object because there are classical solutions that you have. Yeah. Not perturbation theory. So, what is this? Yes. That's a very good question. So, the 
the idea what Spenta is asking is, let's say you have some short shield black hole, right? That's some condensate of closed string fields. That's some condensate of gravitons and maybe B fields and dilettons and so on. So you have that background. And all we're considering here is some sort of a perturbative ex excited string on top of that background. We're trying to compute the free energy of that string. So why should that know anything about the background on which it is propagating? Well, this might be 1 over gn, but what you're saying is the coefficient here might not be the, the full, it might not be sort of a over 4. This we know is 1 over g newton just by counting the power. You're asking whether this really accounts for the full black hole entropy or there is some just classical piece that this, this would miss. Yes, so this might be some renormalization of that. But the point is in the open string case it works. So when you compute the open string disk diagram, again, you have some classical background, you compute the disk diagram, and that actually gives you the action of the D-brain on which the string is attached. So even there, you might have made this objection that there is some classical background and you just have an open string that is fluctuating around the D-brain. So why on earth does the disk diagram know about the tension of the D-brain, for, for example? But there, as I will like sort of talk about next time, the connection is unmistakably clear that you can compute the disk diagram. This SL2R, can you do something with SL2R? And you get some finite, well-defined answer which agrees, passes many different checks, like this deep brain tension works out to be correct. So that is the hope that, that yeah, that is the argument, but somehow the idea is that the string propagating in the background might know about, might know about it. Yes. In fact, in your old sustained papers, the idea was that this would be a renormalization. Yeah, but exactly. Oh, that this would just be a renormalization? Yes. It would renormalize G Newton, so you would get some, you know, because at this quantity, as you're computing, it's like the, it's like the entropy, free energy of the gas of gravitons propagating on top of the black hole. So that would give you some, it's yes, the free energy of the gas of gravitons propagating on yes, top Yes, but for gravitons, the first diagram you get for particles is just a one loop diagram. Right? So there's no like, the, there is no analog of the sphere diagram in case of particles. So this is sort of a tree level contribution, which is why it's special to string theory. The analog of the graviton would be a torus diagram. Um, so this, this analog of the sphere diagram doesn't really exist when you just have particles. That's why it's interesting to compute this. Do you think there's an analog for even a higher temperature? Um, yeah, presumably. but. For those, we don't even have a theory, right? Like, so it's hard to, uh, yeah. So, so in particular, if you took a, yeah, some, some cigar geometry, you would, you, the idea would be that some of this sphere diagram defined in some way yes. would give you the exactly. free energy. Of exactly, the, exactly. That's the idea. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sort of the, yeah, and if, if this sort of is not a renormalization of the original thing but gives you the full answer, then you might call string theory like an induced theory of gravity where the entire sort of contribution to the free energy is coming from, I don't know, this, this is sort of the, the hope. Yeah, it may not give the right answer. Like the, the hope that set, what I said that it works in the open string case doesn't mean it has to work in the closed string case. It doesn't, doesn't have to. Okay, thanks.